welcome back to Dementia Basics Online. Uh, so my name is Herman Chique Alfonso, for those who are joining us today for the first time. So I'm the Education Coordinator for the Dementia Society of Ottawa and Renfrew County. So today is part two, the signs of dementia, uh, types of dementia. So our guest speaker is Dr. Frank Knuffel. He is a physician, researcher, and uh, also a professor at the University of Ottawa. And he also works at Bruyere Memory Program. So without further ado, I will turn over to uh, Frank Knuffel. And welcome, Frank. Thank you, Herman and Chelsea. And good evening, everyone. And uh, so you, as you heard today, it's uh, part two. So um, I'm going to assume most of you took part in uh, part one uh, last week, so the aging brain. Uh, we will recapture some of that uh, just to, to, to be sure we refresh the important parts. Today, then, we'll be doing uh, the dementia, um, lots of subtopics, uh, the, the chronic disease of dementia, classifying it, uh, learning and forgetting, um, and then different types of dementia, the Alzheimer's type, vascular, and then others, and then finally ending with some delirium and depression. <clears throat> and then next week, if you uh, are so inclined, you will be uh, hearing more about research in the area and uh, as well as uh, some of the services available in the region. So um, let's get back to a quick review of part one. Um, you will have learned that the brain has different regions that uh, do different things, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, uh, temporal lobe, and uh, the uh, so hearing is located here between the temporal and occipital lobe. Vision is at the back of the brain and the occipital lobe, and executive functioning is part of the frontal lobe. And the reason we're redoing this today is because it will be very applicable uh, uh, later on uh, today as we talk about uh, different diseases. Language, of course, is close to hearing, and uh, visual spatial abilities are um, related to the vision, but also the parietal lobe. And finally, orientation, both to time and place, are part of the temporal lobe. And then we flip the brain around and now are looking to the inside of the right hemisphere. And then this part of the temporal lobe here is called the hippocampus, which is uh, where memory consolidation uh, happens. And you recall that the brain, uh, one of the big parts of the brain, of course, are neurons. These are the cells that make up the uh, the uh, the brain, and uh, you have uh, dendrites, you have uh, a cell body, and then you've got the long axon, and electricity essentially travels down the long axon to the terminal endings. And we have somewhere between 20 and 100 billion of these um, in our brain. Um, and how they work is that between the cells, we got the ending of one axon, and the electricity runs down, it causes the release of these neurotransmitters, um, they're released and then they attach to the other side to the dendrite of the next neuron and cause a change in electrical uh, current and then a new electrical charge will run down the dendrite back to the cell body, down to the axon and so on. And uh, if you look at it in three dimensions, so here you have a cell body, it's lit up, you see the electricity runs down here to the axon. The chemicals are released to this dendrite. It goes to the body. Electricity runs down. It excites the dendrite of the next cell and so on. And then you have the brain firing various um, nerve cells at various times. And that pattern then ultimately allows us to think and smell and see and hear and those kinds of things. Last week, you would have also heard about the importance of the circulation in the brain. Here you have uh, an injection of a radioactive dye into the circulatory system. And here you see the carotid artery and various branches. And you see that there's tiny, tiny branches and uh, literally millions, in fact, billions of tiny um, sub arteries that ultimately one little capillary feeds one neuron. 
So a lot of, uh, of this branching going on from one big pipe to smaller and smaller pipes uh, feeding the brain cells. Last week, you would have also heard about the four, uh, six <laughs> cognitive domains. I mean, there are more, but for now, I think it's, it's a good start. So memory, orientation, concentration, ability to filter out the noise, language, our ability to communicate through sounds, visual spatial ability, and, and of course, words as well, visual spatial ability, so ability to see something and be able to navigate through it, and executive functioning, which is the highest order of functioning, planning, executing, evaluating what we've done um, to make it better next time. And you heard about aging. The sad news is that 50,000 brain cells die pretty much every day after the age of 29, which is about 20 million per year for an annual reduction of about 0.1% of our brain mass. However, between the ages of 20 and 90, you can see there'd be a net loss of about 10% of our brain cells altogether. So um, let's uh, dive in then today's topic. And that, of course, is dementia. And so let's start by talking about chronic disease. So what do we know about chronic diseases? Typically, they take decades to develop. And the important part of this is that we treat the symptoms. So if we take the example of arthritis, we know that people start sometimes showing some changes in joints in their 40s. They get a little worse in their 50s and in their 60s, they might have some deformities and in the 70s, it might be worse, right? So it takes decades to develop. There's no cure for arthritis. What we can do though is decrease the symptoms with anti-inflammatories, with pain medication and the like, um, do exercises to try to keep the joints in, in the right shape. Um, so that's, that's chronic diseases. And that works for osteoarthritis. Same thing for chronic lung disease or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Same thing for chronic kidney disease. Same thing for chronic heart disease. And unfortunately, the same thing for chronic brain disease. All of these take decades to develop and the best we can do is try to manage uh, symptoms for the time being. So, um, before we go on and talk about uh, differentiating normal aging, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia, um, let's get a couple of definitions out of the way. So we have activities of daily living, ADLs, and we have two types that we're going to focus on today, basic activities of daily living, and these are the ones we do to ourselves. So for us to function in society, we need to dress we need to wash, we need to bathe, we need to toilet and feed ourselves. And those are things that we do to our own person to, uh, to function in society. So those are basic activities of daily living. Then there are what we call the instrumental activities of daily living. And they're more about fitting into society and doing more complex things that are partly for us, but that are not directly to ourselves. So banking and finances are instrumental activities of daily living, shopping, managing medications, making meals, using a microwave, using a stove, an oven, housekeeping like laundry, dishes, vacuuming, right? Managing a telephone, managing a mobile phone, managing the computer, a DVD player and cable. So these are things that we do to function in today's society. Um, but they go well beyond showering ourselves, dressing ourselves, feeding ourselves. So these are the instrumental activities of daily living. And why this is important, and this is probably one of the most important slides of the evening, is that we have aging, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. And these are intersecting circles because they overflow from one into the other. There's an overlap in time when we're sort of between aging and mild cognitive impairment. And then there's a time when we're sort of advanced mild cognitive impairment, early dementia, 
before we sort of cross over completely. So what's in our circle? The first is the cognitive domains that are affected. So these are just examples, but when we age, we do have some mild memory loss. Our language production isn't as good. Our vocabulary shrinks a little bit. And in executive functioning, we're a little slower in, in processing certain bits of information. We don't see um, uh, in, in the same way uh, to abstract things and that kind of thing. So mild changes as, um, in, as part of aging. And importantly, though, we're still able to perform all of our instrumental activities of daily living. So despite the fact that we're getting older, we can go to the bank, we can do our banking, we make our own meals, we can clean our own house, et cetera. So then we have mild cognitive impairment. So now we have a significant change, a measurable change in memory or language or executive functioning. And so if we do a memory test, we will score below the normal score. However, mild cognitive impairment, they are, we are still able to do our own instrumental activities of daily living. So for instance, we may forget what we need to buy in groceries. So if we go to the store and, and just buy randomly, we'll come back and we'll have four cartons of milk in the fridge, which of course we can't possibly drink in, in the week. So we make a list. So we have a short-term memory problem. We do forget things. We forget what we need to buy, but because we make a list, we're able to do our own shopping and we don't buy things in duplicate. We have a system for making sure we pay our bills and the like. So mild cognitive impairment, definitely a measurable change, but still performing instrumental activities of daily living independently. So now when we get to dementia, of course, we have significant changes usually in multiple domains, so memory and language and executive functioning. But most importantly, now we have impaired instrumental activities of daily living. So now not only do we forget, we do forget to pay our bills and we get behind uh, and pay interest. And we forget pots on the stove and they burn and, and the like. Um, so, and initially, and we'll talk about this more, we have the instrumental activities of daily living that are affected and later the basic as well. So with aging, at some point, things may get worse and we may transition to mild cognitive impairment. Um, if it's a reversible condition and we're able to fix the problem, so let's say someone has... Um, thyroid problems. So they their cognition declines, they're struggling, but they're still doing their uh, instrumental activities of daily living. But then we treat the thyroid at, that we can go right back to normal aging. However, if we do transition from mild cognitive impairment to dementia, um, that's a one-way ticket, unfortunately. So once we lose our ability to perform activities of daily living, um, there's usually a no return from that. So now let's do a little bit more definitions. So dementia is a syndrome. It's usually chronic and progressive, and it can be caused by a variety of brain illnesses, right? So a variety of brain illnesses, meaning it's not one condition. It is a basket of conditions that affect memory, thinking, behavior, and as we said, the ability to perform everyday activities. And that's the World Health Organization that came up with that definition, but it fits very nicely with our picture from before. So neurodegeneration or neurodegenerative disease has two components, the neuro part, meaning it has to do with nerve cells, and then the degeneration part, which is the, the characterizing the progressive deterioration of the structure um, and ultimately the death of the cells with the deterioration and function of the organs over time. So this could be heart 
degeneration, but of course, in the case of neurodegeneration, we're talking about nerve cells and then the nerve function that deteriorates over time. So that's neurodegenerative disease. And uh, it's because dementia is progressive, of course, symptoms will get um, worse over time. And importantly, um, consciousness is not affected. Obviously, if you're unconscious, you can't perform well on a memory test, you can't dress yourself, um, but this is not dementia, that's an acute uh, brain state, which is due to something else, of course. So, that, that by definition, dementia has to have neurodegeneration, it has to be progressive, it has to affect functioning, and consciousness is not affected. And so when we say dementia is an umbrella term, it's because of it can be caused by many different conditions. So dementia is the worst brain state when it comes to functioning. Um, and it can be caused by any number of conditions including these on here, but we'll, we'll get into more detail uh, about that a little later. But so dementia is an umbrella term. It is not a diagnosis, it is a syndrome, and it's caused by multiple conditions. So let's just do some numbers. Um, and I'm sorry about the busyness of this slide, but um, in 2016, there were half a million Canadians living with dementia. Of those, 16,000 were under the age of 65. And every year, 25,000 new cases are being diagnosed. And by 2030, we had predicted there would be almost a million cases of dementia in Canada. 1.1 million is the number of Canadians affected directly or indirectly by the disease, because even though there's half a million that have the condition, there's usually at least one other caregiver that, that's directly affected by the condition. And back in 2016, already we were spending $10 billion to care for Canadians living with dementia. So a serious condition for sure. Now let's go back to classifying dementia. And so there are two major subtypes. So if you recall, we had the picture of the neuron. So any number of things can happen to that neuron that would affect um, your ability to do things um, and cause dementia. So there's Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's dementia, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's plus group of symptom and conditions, posterior cortical atrophy, trisomy 21, Huntington's. So these are all different types of conditions that can affect a neuron and cause cognitive loss and functional loss. So that's the cells themselves. But there are equally a large number of extracellular things that can happen. So the cells don't get sick themselves, but they get hurt because of something else happening. So vascular dementia, of course, is when the circulation to the brain is affected. And if you cut off the flow of oxygen to the brain, of course, you're going to hurt brain cells, and eventually you will no longer be able to take care of yourself, right? And you will have dementia. So vascular is one condition normal pressure hydrocephalus. If the pressure builds up in the brain and brain cells get squished and die just from being squished, that's another possibility. Chronic traumatic, uh, traumatic encephalopathy is the boxer syndrome, right? So Muhammad Ali, for instance, um, was hit in the head a few too many times and, and accumulated damage um, and it produced eventually dementia. Metabolic toxins, so alcohol, for instance, you can kill your brain cells off with alcohol. Traumatic brain injury, if you um, have a severe car accident and your head gets injured, of course, brain cells will die. And finally, infection, uh, many in types of infection can, infect, uh, can hurt the brain, um, one of them, of course, being HIV. So things that happen to the brain cells themselves 
and then things that happen to the brain um, cells uh, from outside. Now, we divide sort of arbitrarily, but young onset dementia and older onset dementia in, into, so we have two groups, right? And so we're gonna look at them individually. So for the group that's under 65, it's a smaller group, but you can see that Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia represent about half of the cases. Then you've got frontal temporal, alcohol, um, and Lewy body sort of accounting for 10-ish percent each, Huntington's, and then there's sort of a mixed bag of leftover ones here. But here's the one to think about that half of, con half of conditions are all either Alzheimer's or vascular. Now, if we look at the group 65 years and older, now you've got vascular at 25%, Alzheimer's at 25%, and another 25% of mixed Alzheimer's and, and other. So that you've got a good three quarters, more than three quarters of all cases really being Alzheimer's and vascular and mixed with a small amount of frontal temporal and Lewy body. Um, so in the younger group, there's a lot more variability than, than there is in, in the older group. Um, a lot of questions at the memory clinic, of course. Um, my dad has Alzheimer's. What are my chances of getting Alzheimer's? Um, so this looks at um, what the genetic uh, linkages are, what percentage of genetic linkages there are. So in Alzheimer's, only about somewhere between 1% and 5% of all cases are linked to a, directly to a family member whereas 95 to 99% are essentially random. Vascular dementia, it's a little bit harder to tell because in families that have vascular disease, there is going to be an increased risk. Um, life, but there's also a significant lifestyle um, component to it. So if no one smokes in the family, um, and then suddenly someone smokes a whole lot, then they're at an increased risk of having vascular dementia, but it has nothing to do with genetic component. On the other hand, a family that has high cholesterol and they have kidney disease and heart disease and strokes in the family, then of course that's familial risk to have other vascular dementia. Frontal temporal is about 50-50. Lewy body, there is a small number of uh, familial uh, links, but most are sporadic. Parkinson's disease, it's, a, it's a, about 10 to 15 percent are familial. And then, of course, Huntington's disease, it's 100 percent uh, genetic, uh, direct link. So now we've gone through sort of the chronic disease. We talked about the differences between normal aging and mild cognitive impairment and dementia, and some of the definitions. Um, and now let's talk about brain development. And so it, in normal learning, uh, you learn at the, when, you, when, when we're freshly born, the first thing we do is we learn to hold up our head. So that's our first motor activity. Then we start being able to focus on seeing things and hearing things. And eventually we learn single words. Uh, over time, then we get more muscular control, more body control. We're able to stand up. We're able to uh, take maybe a few steps. Um, eventually we'll be able to use the stairs. We can follow simple one-step commands. We learn to use a spoon to feed ourselves. And over time, we understand more, our vocabulary grows, we start taking care of ourselves, brushing our teeth, dressing, become continent, we control our bladder and bowels. We develop fine motor skills, so we learn to do a button, to tie a bow, um, rather than just saying boy and toy, we now say 
the boy is playing with my toy and we can name people rather than just boy we'll say john and mary and the like and over time we improve our concentration even more and we can read uh, pages paragraphs a book mathematics we'll learn to count um, then we'll learn to do formulas we we'll learn to balance a checkbook and finally you know we learn to manage a sixty thousand dollar budget at home and so this is what we call the model of the onion because at the beginning we know nothing then we learn little bits and then more and more the circles build on the previous learning until we get to the outer layer which is the, the managing the budget or you know having a complex job or the like now dementia is essentially the unlearning and it's quite literally in the reverse order so the first thing that becomes difficult to do is to manage that sixty thousand dollar budget over time it becomes hard even to balance just one account the checkbook um after that it's hard just to do simple math we have increasing difficulty with concentration and we can't remember what happened in the last chapter so reading a book becomes more difficult we have do more difficulty with fine motor skills our sentences get shorter our content gets simpler and we've got names of people that we care about and so on um so really dementia is as an unlearning uh, of uh, the things that we uh, previously had learned so now we're going to dive into you know some of the specific uh, conditions so let's start with alzheimer's and this is uh, these are two brains and you have on the left side a normal healthy brain probably a younger uh, adult uh, maybe in their 30s and then on the right side you've got this um, brain that's shriveled essentially right it's it's lost mass it's lost brain cells and even in volume and the total volume it, it's it's much smaller so what's happening on the cellular level again on the left we have a normal brain with the neurons that are interconnected the the, the cells look healthy the space between them is nice and clean and now we have cells that are developing these these wrinkled um, tangles the neurofibrillary tangles inside the cells related to the tau protein and this junk starts accumulating outside the cells these amyloid plaques made of amyloid beta protein so those are the two proteins that are associated with alzheimer's disease and things that we test for in the brains of people um, with alzheimer's type uh, dementia and to look at it in three dimensions again you saw this previously the healthful healthy brain with you know nice healthy looking cells they're nicely interconnected and electricity running smoothly between them and the spaces are clean and again here cells that are starting to wrinkle the the connections are, are starting to go you've got these plaques um, that are collecting outside and you've got these uh, neurofibrillary tangles on the inside and you see even though this health this one is healthy it's not sending a message this one is not receiving it anymore because it's starting to uh, deteriorate and as we said before of course dementia is a progressive disease um, so uh, it starts off a little bit of damage uh, right here in the temporal lobe in the hippocampus um, which affects memory and you've got a little bit of difficulty planning because the frontal lobe is starting to be affected here um, then you see it's getting darker here and it's spreading out more so now we have a little bit more language impacted a sense of direction is, is impacted sense of time and then ultimately we get into personal care where we can't put together you know how to uh, uh, tie a shoelace or or how to button a shirt or that kind of thing and and uh, 
because so much of the brain is now affected that uh, personal care is affected. And again, here we will start with mild cognitive impairment of the Alzheimer's type to mild to moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. And so these are the symptoms at the top. And then of course, the activities of daily living on the bottom. So again, mild cognitive impairment. Yes, we have memory loss. Um, no significant alteration in judgment, uh, maybe a little bit of orientation difficulty, but preserved activities of daily living in the mild cognitive impairment of Alzheimer's type. When we get the mild Alzheimer's disease, now the confusion is more significant, judgment starts being affected, mood might be affected, personality changes, a little bit of anxiety, but now in addition, we have difficulties with financial transactions. We'll start forgetting to take our medication. And driving ability uh, starts to be uh, uh, something we have to start tracking. In moderate Alzheimer's disease, uh, then the memory loss is significant. There's more confusion about things. Uh, we'll repeat ourselves more. Um, there might be repetitive movements, there might be hallucinations, certainly there's delusions where we misinterpret things that are going on, there may be paranoia, we forget where we put our keys and then we blame someone for having come and stolen our keys. And there's more irritability because we can't really explain what's going on around us and that just causes us to be upset. And now, of course, when it comes to activities of daily living, multiple domains are affected, and driving usually needs to stop um, somewhere between mild and moderate uh, stages of the disease. And then finally, severe Alzheimer's disease now. There's no more sense of self. Um, we don't recognize family members or loved ones. Uh, we have difficulty communicating because the words won't come out the way we want them to, and we have difficulty understanding other people. And eventually, we're completely dependent on others for care. We need help with dressing. We need help getting showered. Um, we may even need help uh, to be fed. And we're often incontinent. So again, the progression um, from mild cognitive impairment to early dementia, moderate dementia, and severe dementia. And so the risk factors, we talked a little bit earlier about genetics. Um, it's rare that it's familial, but there are some traits that might be increasing uh, in uh, being inherited. Education seems to be a, a, an important uh, part of it. Um, both formal and informal education seems to protect against dementia of Alzheimer's type, and lifelong learning protects as well. Cardiovascular disease seems to make Alzheimer's disease worse. So hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, of course, will make it worse. Um, poor diet will make it worse. Um, and uh, sleep apnea, uh, you know, cutting the oxygen supply to the brain will make uh, Alzheimer's disease worse as well. Uh, so management, just like from last week, you, you heard there Physical exercises are always good to do. Cognitively stimulating activities. We want to keep the brain active. It's always a good idea. And social engagement, right? The last thing we want to do is hide in a corner. We need to be out interacting with people to keep the brain stimulated. We need to eat well. We want to sleep well. And of course, we want to have uh, all of our health conditions managed by a family physician, nurse practitioner, or uh, um, whatever clinician. So what about neurotransmitters? So if you recall, we would said that the electricity runs down the axon, and there's release of the neurotransmitters. They connect with the uh, dendrite receptors. They cause an uh, electrical change, and then that fires the next cell. So you can imagine if with uh, early stages of uh, dementia of the Alzheimer's type, this cell is starting to deteriorate a little bit, 
there's not as much of these chemicals that are transported down to the end. So when the electrical current comes here, less of this chemical is produced. This cell won't be stimulated the, the right amount. It won't get an electrical charge. So that part of the circuit will be not performing well. So now what if we could have medication that could boost the amount of neurotransmitter available to the brain? And that's exactly which, uh, what the uh, cholinesterase inhibitors um, do. So the cholinesterase inhibitors are, astel, uh, are donepezo, rivastigmine, and galantamine, with acetylcholine being the neurotransmitter mostly associated with memory. And it's decreased in the brains of people with dementia of the Alzheimer's type. So donepezol, rivastigmine, and galantamine are the ones that can increase the amount of acetylcholine in the brain. And they were developed in 1996, 1997, and 2001, respectively, with the patch of rivastigmine being developed in 2007. Um, interestingly, the uh, galantamine, uh, the uh, bulb of the daffodil is actually where we, uh, where we get that uh, chemical from. And in fact, there, there's belief that the uh, Egyptians um, knew about the brain stimulating uh, impact of the daffodils uh, 4,000 years ago. Um, now, we're stimulating the brain, which is what we're trying to do, which is supposed to help the brain. Unfortunately, we're also stimulating the digestive system. So one out of eight people can have nausea or bloating or diarrhea. And it can also increase bladder stimulation. So the amount of times we have to go uh, urinate. Um, in addition, the heart has receptors to acetylcholine and about one in a hundred uh, needs to stop uh, denepacil or galanthamine or the like uh, because of slowness of the heart rate. Finally, the only other medication approved in Canada at this time for the management of the dementia or especially the Alzheimer's type, is memantine. Um, it was developed in 1968. Believe it or not, it was designed to treat diabetes. Um, in the 80s, we discovered that if it was hitting uh, um, receptors in the brain, these NMDA receptors, and uh, then we thought, oh, well, if it's hitting the brain, maybe it can help with thinking. Um, in our experience, it, there's really minimal impact on cognition. Um, it may decrease the clinical deteriorating because deterioration because uh, um, reducing the exo, excitotoxicity that's part of neurodegeneration. Um, in, the, in the lab, this has been shown. In, in real life, it's, it's not seen very often. The good news is there's very few side effects, so most people tolerate it well. But because of the lack of evidence that it really makes a difference, it's actually not covered by um, the Ontario Drug uh, Benefit Plan. Um, so people have to pay out of pocket or if someone's insurance covers for it. So um, memantine is sort of the... Um, the odd odd medication out is we will try it sometimes uh, if the family is willing to pay or if the if the uh, patient has insurance. Um, but in my experience, it's been rare that I've really had a benefit from it. And then, of course, in in all cases of dementia, but in Alzheimer's type dementia as well, um, sleep is important, and the sleep cycle can be broken. So that um, the uh, we want to treat that and, and get the sleep cycle back into the evening. So trazodone, mirtazapine um, are are good medications for that. Uh, there is a risk of depression and, and anxiety, and we talked about that uh, before. And uh, some of the medications that are safe to use in people with uh, cognitive uh, impairment is citalopram, escitalopram, 
venlafaxine, mirtazapine, again, and trazodone. And if there's severe agitation, paranoia, and psychosis, then we can use the antipsychotics like risperidone and quetiapine. So again, managing the symptoms is an important component uh, uh, of the care uh, for people with dementia. So that was uh, the Alzheimer's type. The the uh, and let's go on to talk about vascular dementia. So there's um, a couple of ways that uh, uh, vascular dementia comes about. The first, of course, is that related to a stroke. And in a stroke, there's an acute blockage of a larger artery. And everything that's downstream from there, like a real chunk of the brain, will be uh, affected and will die and turn to water. And so when we do a brain scan, we see a big hole, a little bit like uh, Swiss cheese, if you like, that, that air bubble that we can see when we're slicing uh, cheese. So this is what a stroke is like. So the blood supply is cut off um, and there's typically a clot. And of course, the symptoms that the person will have will depend on where um, in the brain the stroke is. So if it's the language center that's hit, of course, language will be affected. It's, if it's the motor center that's hit, then half the body uh, may not be working well. So there's the stroke-related dementia. So there's a sudden damage to the brain, and that can cause dementia. But then there's also a post-stroke dementia. So about one out of five people after having had a stroke will develop a gradually progressive decline subsequently. It's as though the stroke cause some kind of a, a spark that, that uh, triggers the subsequent development of dementia. And of course, a person who's had a stroke has, is at increased risk of having further strokes, be it large vessels or small vessels. Um, and then of course, increasing further the risk of having a vascular dementia. There's also a subcortical dementia, which is simply where in the brain the location is of the vascular disease. And the subcortical, the cortex of the brain is the outside of the brain. And usually on the inside, we have the subcortical regions, uh, more the parts that connect the different centers of the brain. So um, when you, you'll have uh, damage of the vascular walls there, um, and uh, they're usually smaller um, zones that are affected. And of course, again, depending on if it's the memory part of the brain or if it's the visual spatial part of the brain or it's the speaking part of the brain, depending, that's when you'll see um, where, where the damages will cause different symptoms. And this sort of gives a picture of it. So, so here's uh, the carotid artery and the circle of Willis, and you see here a branch coming out. And you see that this part of the brain here is fed by all of these little branches. And of course, this is in two dimensions, but this would also be the case in three dimensions coming out at us. And so here we've got a cutout of an artery. And you see here, there's a clot that's completely blocked this artery. So theoretically, there's no blood running down this way to feed this part of the brain. However, this is still getting oxygen. This is still getting oxygen. So it's not completely dead, but it is grayed out. It's, it's going to be affected and we will be able to see uh, that damage if we do a, a brain scan. So here it is. And you can see these white flecks that are throughout the brain. Um, these are all areas where there has been suboptimal blood flow. Um, this might be someone who has diabetes. It might be someone with high blood pressure, chronically high blood pressure, or elevated cholesterol in the family. And this is what vascular uh, damage looks like on a brain scan. So what are some of the characteristics of the symptoms of vascular dementia? 
Well, as you could expect, every time there's a new blockage in an artery, there is sort of a more sudden appearance of uh, new symptoms. So if you have pretty regular language and things are going well for you, and then all of a sudden you wake up and you have difficulty speaking, the words aren't coming out well, um, you may have had a small stroke overnight. And then you might be fine. You might stay that way for six months, a year. Then you might have um, uh, the parietal lobe that might be affected. And now you have visual spatial difficulties. You have, you can't sort of figure out how to get the button through the button uh, hole. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, or that kind of a, that kind of thing. So stepwise progression, that sort of stability, then a drop, then stability, then a drop, typically associated with vascular disease. Um, but also because the blood circulation, sometimes there's a smaller clot, sometimes there's a bit of blood flow that gets around it, sometimes it doesn't get around it. So you can get fluctuations from day to day or hour to hour. So people who have a lot of uh, variation in their abilities um, are more likely to have a vascular component to their dementia as well. And as we said, depending on where the clot is, where the anoxia is, where that part of the brain that is not getting enough oxygen is, um, it could be executive functioning, it could be language, it could be visual, it could be visual spatial, um, and, and, and so on. So um, that makes it much harder to diagnose because there is no one pattern, like there is sort of a more traditional pattern in Alzheimer's type dementia, there isn't a, a clear pattern because depending on where the blockage is, you'll get a different pattern. But um, there's sort of a common denominator. If there's been enough of these small vascular events, as we saw in, in the brain scan, and that person would likely have a little bit of speed of processing difficulty, some language difficulty, some fine motor difficulty, and the memory might not be impaired as, as a complete forgetfulness like in Alzheimer's type dementia, but would certainly have a, a slower memory, meaning just let me think about what I did yesterday. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Oh yeah, uh, I drove to visit my daughter yesterday. So it's not gone, the information, but it does take longer to recall. And uh, one of the uh, particular features of vascular dementia is that uh, typically people that have that kind of dementia are more aware of their cognitive changes. The typical Alzheimer's type uh, patient forgets, and then they forget that they forgot. Um, this person is going to be more aware. They're going to say, oh, uh, I missed an appointment yesterday. It was really tough. And then um, I only remembered in the afternoon, and it was too late to, to, to get to my doctor or the like. So, But they're more likely to be able to remember certain events, uh, and so they're more aware of the changes, which can also cause more depression, because the more aware you are of things getting worse, of course, the more likely your mood is going to be affected. So management of vascular dementia, again, we want to manage the diabetes, the cholesterol, the blood pressure, we might do a trial of a cholinesterase inhibitor. We definitely want to treat the depression if, if it's bad enough. And again, we want to practice good brain health, exercising, doing cognitive exercises, and being socially engaged. And let's finish off with sort of the others. And so um, the frontal temporal dementias would be the next uh, to talk about. Um, and if you recall, this is typically a younger population than the Alzheimer's type. We'd said 40% was familial. It's a tau protein, but it's a different tau from uh, the Alzheimer's. 
And here you have a brain of someone with frontal temporal de dementia. And you see that here, this is a well relatively well-preserved part of the brain. This is still pretty healthy, but look at this, right? This is all uh, shriveled and, and shrunk. This is the frontal, of course, part of the brain. And here's the temporal lobe. And again, quite affected um, in, 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 its, uh, in its shape. And of course, if you remember from the domains of the brain, the frontal lobe does executive functioning. Um, there's a, some language in the temporal lobe. Um, and so we have sort of the frontal type, frontal temporal dementia, which affects behavior. They show apathy, they're disinhibited, they overeat. Um, they have difficulty planning and, and making decisions. And this is a little bit more likely to be familial. And then there's the temporal type, which of course has two types of the language difficulties, the aphasias, which is word finding difficulties, non-fluent speech. And then the semantic dementias, which is more the meaning of the words is lost. Um, they can be quite fluent. Um, just what they say doesn't uh, make any sense. And so in the aphasias, there's the progressive non-fluent aphasia, which is about word finding. We said it's non-fluent. Um, and often they'll have uh, some Parkinsonism as well, so some um, cogwheeling and the like. The frontal temporal semantic type uh, dementia um, we'll have word finding and word meaning difficulties. We said they're more fluent, their sentences are meaningless, and they're less likely to be aware. The uh, primary progressives are typically aware that something is going on with their speech, uh, the semantics less likely to. Um, frontal temporals typically don't respond too well to cholinesterase inhibitors. Maybe the semantics do a little bit more, um, but it's always worth uh, considering. Uh, certainly the behavioral changes are, are important, and if they're disruptive, uh, we try to, to uh, treat them with pharmacology um, and behavioral uh, interventions, of course, as well. We need to, as always, manage our vascular risk factors and uh, keep practice good brain health. Uh, Lewy body dementia is the next type, and you see here it's sort of this Lewy body inclusion um, that, that, that defines the disease. And the symptoms are visual hallucinations, Parkinsonism, REM sleep disorder, which is when we act out our dreams, and uh, difficulties with visual spatial abilities, attention, and it's it's typically a fluctuating course. So there'll be good days and bad days, but unrelated to circulation. And uh, some of these symptoms in uh, Lewy body do uh, overlap with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And so Lewy body is, is sort of the, uh, a little bit the ugly duckling. We, we don't diagnose it as, as well and as often as we probably should. Um, and it, it's often missed. Uh, so Lewy body, uh, rivastigmine is the typically the first cholinesterase inhibitor we try. Uh, if the REM sleep is very disruptive, we'll treat it. And of course, if we have physical symptoms, we uh, consider Parkinson's medications. We also um, have hallucinations, and the challenge is that using antipsychotics in Lewy body is pretty much contraindicated, so we have to be very careful about that. Of course, we manage the vascular risk factors as always, and we want to practice good brain health. Parkinson's disease itself is a disease of the substantia nigra and uh, the depletion of dopamine. Um, there's alpha synuclein deposits, um, and uh, they they combine to create Lewy bodies as well. Um, and the symptoms, of course, are stiffness, rigidity, and tremors of the major muscles of the body. And here you see sort of the, the typical features, the blank facial expression, the slow 
slurred speech, the rigidity and tremor of the hands, the short shuffling gait, a reduced arm swing. Classic features of Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease progresses, and you here you see it starts lower in the in the basal ganglia, and then it comes up and, and spreads throughout the, the brain over time. And you see that about just half, somewhere between half and three quarters of all people suffering from Parkinson's disease will eventually develop dementia. And so Parkinson's and Lewy body disease are essentially cousins of each other. Um, Lewy body has um, a little bit more memory loss, disorientation, the visual hallucinations, the sleep issues. Parkinson's disease is more associated with judgment and reasoning difficulties, some paranoia, depression, and speech impediments. And Parkinson's disease has to have a year of physical symptoms before developing the cognitive symptoms. And conversely, we expect the, the cognitive things to be first in the Lewy body disease before developing physical symptoms. And again, for Parkinson's disease, then uh, we, if they have dementia, we can consider the cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, again, you want to avoid the antipsychotics uh, because they make the physical symptoms worse, actually, in Parkinson's disease. And again, treat our vascular risk factors and practice good brain health. Um, and uh, in the Parkinson's with dementia, of course, the Parkinson's disease needs to be treated. We also need to consider antidepressants um, and the usual uh, factors. Finally, there's Parkinson's plus syndrome, and we won't spend a lot of time in it, but it's uh, a group of diseases. Um, and they start with executive functioning difficulties, often language difficulties. They have Parkinson's symptoms as well. They usually have visual spatial elements and sometimes depression. And we'll end with uh, mixed dementia, where we uh, are going to really have combinations of types of dementia. Um, there's, you might have a little bit of Alzheimer's, a little bit of vascular, or a little bit of Alzheimer's and a little bit of Lewy body, or a little bit of Lewy body and vascular, and so on. And of course, you can imagine a mixed dementia is really hard to diagnose because there's really no pattern whatsoever because you'll have bits and pieces of different types of dementia, which makes them difficult to diagnose uh, um, and uh, Vascular dementia by itself is already hard to diagnose because depending on what parts of the brain are affected, but then if you add in a little bit of Alzheimer's or a little bit of Lewy body, it really gets messy quickly. So just to finish off quickly, um, delirium and dementia um, and depression are the three Ds associated with aging and they can all have similar symptoms. Um, delirium then when you're differentiating delirium and dementia the uh, delirium appears suddenly um, and uh, often there's a change in level of consciousness so if you have a, a patient with a decreased level of consciousness and suddenly they're they're confused and disoriented then they're more likely to have delirium than dementia Causes of delirium are similar to the things that can cause dementia. They have medication, infection, dehydration, brain trauma, alcohol, et cetera. So anything that can hurt the brain suddenly can hurt, cause a sudden onset delirium. And so going on to depression, of course, depression is more around depressed mood, but there's a loss of interest and enjoyment, reduced energy. But it can also impact uh, activities of daily living because it's sometimes hard to tell that the person stopped making meals because they could not figure out how to do it. So that's a cognitive problem. Or did they stop making meals because their mood is deteriorating and uh, they, uh, they just didn't feel like making a meal anymore? So um, 
And depression typically needs to last at least two weeks to, uh, to be uh, diagnosed. So depression, uh, there is a, it's even more complicated the relationship between depression and dementia because people with chronic depression are more likely to develop dementia and depression may be an early symptom of dementia as well. So there's a lot of interactions uh, between uh, the two. Um, and uh, right, so uh, the depression may compromise cognitive reserve. So all that reserve we built up by education, by learning on the job and that depression can um, decrease that, allowing uh, dementia to be uh, to, to to appear uh, sooner. Um, this table we won't spend a lot of time on, but it essentially does a comparison between dementia, delirium, and depression. Um, dementia is very slow onset. Delirium is very fast onset, and depression is sort of in between. So years, hours, days weeks, months for, for the duration. Um, and it's uh, dementia is progressive. Uh, delirium is more up and down. And depression uh, is uh, more associated with time of day. Um, alertness, orientation, memory, and so on. Um, there's ways of di differentiating them, which uh, I, I won't go into too, too much detail now. But um, this is sort of uh, a typical medical school exam um, for students. And with that, I will stop and uh, we can uh, open it up for questions.